Hi everyone, and welcome to my talk, Multithreaded Programs, The Good, The Bad, and The Buggy. So I hope you are very excited about NIM and also about NIM uh, capabilities in writing multithreading programs and the potential performance improvement that you can get from this. But maybe you are intimidated by how to debug multithreading. And I hope to help you on this journey. And that after this talk, you will be able uh, to find a way uh, to, toward uh, debugging uh, your programs. So a bit about myself. I'm uh, Mami Ratsim Bazafi. I work on NIM uh, day in, day out, uh, during the day on uh, blockchain, uh, on Ethereum 2. And uh, also, I'm working on multi-threading, deep learning, and cryptography libraries in NIM, and doing uh, data science uh, in Python on the side. I won't talk much about why and why not multi-threading. I assume you want to use it, but just to give you a motivating uh, a motivation. This is uh, a ray tracer, uh, the output of a ray tracer that I wrote, and it took three hours to generate on my 18 cores CPU. Three hours, 18 cores, that will represent about 200,000 seconds. So, main reason of multi-threading? Uh, saving time. But, Assume I change my code to use logarithmic data structures, log two of um, 200,000 will be about 18 seconds. So just a word of warning, be sure that uh, you explode uh, all possible venues for optimization before you start adding new bugs uh, into your programs that are way, way harder to debug than the usual ones. My goal today. I assume you're a cat and you want to play with friends and now you're stuck. I want to help you disentangle uh, your code and your friends and make sure that uh, you can enjoy uh, the benefits that multithreading provides. Some example. The first one is uh, the output of a very simple channel in NIM issues uh, 13936. So here in this example, uh, the channel is working, but you can see that uh, in the uh, log output, you have receiver got 53 and then sender sent 53. So what happened? Was there a time travel or something? No, it's just that um, the order uh, the thread uh, got on the standard output was different and the receiver uh, had priority over the sender. So the first issue with multi-threading is that you cannot rely on uh, the logs order or the timestamps to uh, help you debugs. Second example, you have two global variables, A and B, initialized to zero, thread one, thread two. They, call, uh, they assign one to one of the variable and they echo the other. This can print one, 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 zero, zero, one. And intuitively, it can also print 0, 0. Why? Well, in this example, the compiler sees that A equal 1 and E equal B are independent. So it's free to reorder them. And it can do E equal B before A equal 1, because you didn't express any constraint to uh, order them. And so they can reorder the echoes before the assignment and you can have a zero zero that is displayed. 
last motivating example, the Dynamic Philosophers. It's quite well known, you can search for it on Wikipedia. Uh, the image is taken from there. So you have five philosophers, threads, on around the table, five forks, and they want to think, discuss, and eat. And it's important to not starve. So the goal is to write some algorithm so that everyone is able to finish uh, their dish. And what can happen if the philosophers are greedy? Maybe, oh, sorry, last constraint. Before eating, they need to have uh, a fork in each hand. They cannot eat with only one fork. As there is only five forks, what can happen is that uh, all of the philosophers, if they are greedy, they take a fork and they don't um, uh, put it back as long as they don't eat at least once. But if they all do that, they get stuck, each, uh, each philosopher with one fork, and no progress is made anymore. So, for the next couple of minutes, our agenda is um, reviewing the target audience and some example threaded programs and applications that you might want to write, how to debug them, also how to design them, because debugging uh, is, uh, let's say, at a low level, but maybe you have also bugs in how you organize your code and communication and synchronization between the various components of your program. And lastly, you have uh, the, let's say, correct by construction programs. Correct by construction meaning that your design um, is bug-free due to how uh, it was uh, designed. First, target audience and example threaded programs. Let's start with the low-level, concurrent data structures. Maybe uh, you want to write a channel or maybe a hash table that allow accesses uh, or communication between multiple threads. Or maybe you want to write um, an event bus that would allow uh, threads to subscribe to some topics and others to publish messages uh, about uh, or on some topics or in a game uh, development setting. Maybe you need to um, write an object pool uh, that would uh, allow you to avoid uh, memory allocation and reuse memory uh, for objects, uh, for example, particles that are spawned millions of times uh, per uh, frame and process in a multi-threaded manner, like particles, uh, they are moving, col uh, you have collisions, uh, some are um, uh, hidden behind other objects. Or maybe uh, for ray tracing, uh, the example I gave at first, uh, you want to write uh, tree-like data structures to um, make those uh, logarithmic and also enjoy uh, parallelism, maybe even on a GPU, because um, uh, the techniques that I will talk about, well, not debugging, but uh, organizing, uh, are uh, also valid for GPUs. At a high level, maybe you need to write transactional code, a commit rollback system, for example, for database, or you need to collect metrics or logs from multiple uh, threads or mm, services, or you have to build a service architecture with one component for user interface, one for sound, one for graphics, one for networking, file, everything related to I.O. And if you write um, a game, uh, a component for physics, if you write a web browser component for the just-in-time compilation. And now that we had an overview of what we may want to write, and there are thousands of others, let's talk about debugging. The first thing is that tests 
are not enough for multi-threading, even fuzzing. The state grow really, really fast uh, exponentially with the number of threads uh, that are interleaving uh, between uh, in your own program. For example, if you have just an int 16 on four threads, it's uh, two at the power of 64 states, which is a couple thousands of trillions. And the hardest part is that threads are not deterministic. So if you have code paths uh, that are uh, conditional, maybe in your tests uh, they will not be triggered because uh, for some reason, for some ordering, uh, it only happens if uh, you have a very specific order that happens once in the blue moon. So, let's talk about debugging techniques. The first one uh, is, let's say, assertion-oriented programming. This is actually something that uh, can be done uh, single-threaded. It's not uh, multi-thread only, but it's very, very useful. I, I found it, uh, it helped me catch uh, a lot of bugs in Wave uh, during development. At the beginning uh, of the function, check your preconditions, assumptions uh, about uh, how your function is supposed to be called. called. Uh, have check invariants at the in the output. Check uh, the post conditions. Hopefully, this will be something that can be optimized away by um, Dr. Nim. Uh, with the Z3 uh, theorem prover. Some advices uh, regarding um, assertions in a multi thread setting. The first one is put your worker ID uh, in your logs. So you see, um, you have when compiled option assertions, and I have the assert, and you, uh, I display the worker ID. Uh, also, um, you might want to have uh, n not display only on assertions, but when you have a specific flag uh, that is put, so that you can compile with release, but still activate your assets. And remember that uh, if you combine this with logs, the log order between two threads is random, and it may happen that two threads at the same time uh, trigger an assertion, but one of them gets displayed and the others uh, is not displayed because uh, um, the program was shut down. The other things is logs. Use logs and um, use them well. Make sure that uh, because when multi-threading, like if you have eight cores, uh, it's easy to get swamped into many logs. So split them into uh, topics. For example, in this image, uh, I have three topics, debug, debug mem, debug split. Debug is something that I always want printed. Debug mem is uh, to check uh, memory bugs. And debug split is to check uh, load balancing bugs uh, on parallel for loops, because I need to split uh, my uh, parallel loops into multiple workers. For example, uh, on the left you have a parallel matrix transposition and on the right you have the logs that are produced. And uh, you can see at the beginning of the logs you have worker 25 that is currently on iteration um, 2500 out of 4000. Uh, and it has three teams, so it must split its loop three ways to distribute the uh, work equally. It starts sending six uh, iteration step, which is uh, a stride of 64, so you have uh, actually 64 uh, times six um, inside uh, that uh, work package. And then we don't see uh, the rest uh, of uh, what was sent. Even though uh, this probably happened is in like a couple microseconds, and you have all the logs from the other threads. So, even with very focused logs, 
it's uh, it's hard to track. And uh, also something to remark, worker seven, you see that uh, at one point it was on iteration uh, 3200 with only one tease. It sends half of its, of its uh, 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 remaining work to that teeth. Uh, but then suddenly you have uh, three new teeths that appear. And so this, this is to show that um, the interleaving is uh, non-trivial and uh, how you design and uh, to cope with uh, multi-threading, you, you need to be aware of this and also uh, for debugging. A quick example also, um, be sure to put as much as you can in a single line uh, before uh, flushing your buffer. For example, here you have um, a parallel for loop with i uh, equal 82 on the right. And you can see that the logs are um, separated by a random number of uh, uh, of logs from other threads. So for example, between the event and ordering, you have about 10 lines of unrelated uh, logs. This makes it much harder to, to track down. Hopefully, um, later we will have uh, log analyzers in NIM that would allow you to um, uh, better debug those. Another tool, which is um, uh, this is very specialized to Fred. This is Fred Sanitizer. It's a project by Google that was submitted and integrated in LLVM. Very easy to use. Uh, so basically, it tells you about data races and deadlocks. In this example, I changed the synchronization primitives. Uh, so the, the atomics are using uh, MO relaxed instead of acquire or release, uh, which are um, MO relaxed can be reordered while the others have restriction on ordering uh, that has, are used to make sure that the compiler um, don't uh, reorder like um, what uh, I explained in the global variable A and B uh, and echo uh, a couple of slides ago. And on the right, you see a report that tells you the NIM lines that are in conflict with uh, write and read. And read. Uh, at the bottom, you see that uh, even though I have a data race, my test is successful. So I was lucky to not trigger a bug and uh, receiving maybe a stale value or maybe a value uh, that was uh, a mix match uh, of uh, uh, what was read and what was being written. And now this is an example where I fixed the issue and used the proper uh, acquire and release. And you see there is nothing displayed. Sanitizer are very easy to use. They only require a recompile, so I, I encourage you to use them. Uh, if you use Atomics, use the C++ targets uh, because uh, it's uh, uh, much more tested and I expect that the error uh, displayed would be much better. But it can also be used uh, in C mode, for example, if you use uh, locks and condition variable to detect deadlocks. Another sanitizer, the address sanitizer. This is used to detect incorrect memory addresses, um, memory accesses, for example, uh, to initialize memory uh, or uh, buffer overflows used after, after three leaks. Um, and this can be made aware of custom memory management scheme. Why uh, am I talking about that? Um, because uh, in a multi-threaded context, you will likely have to implement uh, your own memory pool or object pool or uh, maybe a reference uh, counting, atomic reference counting that is aware of threading. Uh, in the future, uh, NIM uh, GC ARC uh, will not uh, 
be a hindrance, but um, you will likely want to uh, do more. Uh, similarly, uh, you can either use it like thread sanitizer, just call uh, F sanitize thread, but if you write your own memory management scheme, you have uh, two procedures, uh, ASAN poison memory region and ASAN unpoisoned memory region uh, that are wrapped uh, on the left and uh, used on the right with uh, templates uh, that uh, just uh, unpoison calls the body of the template and then poison again. And uh, once called, uh, the address sanitizers will tell you if you do something bad with memory. So the function, the call is the same. And besides the sanitizers, you can also use Valgrin. Uh, Valgrin, uh, it's well known for the memory checks. You also have Elgrind uh, for deadlocks and DRD for data race detection. Note that the sanitizers are three to 10x uh, slower than um, regular code, so be sure to compile with release. And Valgrind is also uh, something between three to 10 times slower than the sanitizers themselves. But Valgrind doesn't uh, require you to recompile uh, your binary. Now, the limits of sanitizers. Um, you have the offending lines when you have a bug, but there is no notion of relative time between events. Uh, you know that uh, threads had uh, triggered a bug, but you don't know the sequence of events uh, that lead uh, to that bug as well. So you cannot replay it even in your mind. Uh, you have to uh, take some, uh, like, to guess. Also, it doesn't uh, prove the absence of synchronization bugs. Like if you have uh, code paths that are uh, less traveled, um, the sanitizer will not be able to um, check that code path. And so uh, it might leave synchronization bugs that happen once in a blue moon in production. And lastly, here, uh, you debugged, uh, we debugged the low-level uh, data structures, but it's, it can also be possible to have the wrong approach uh, at a high level. So, uh, addressing the first part, relative time, uh, you can use a vector clock, which are very simple um, objects, um, to track a relative time, uh, causality, between threads. So in this example, uh, taken from Wikipedia, you have thread A, B, and C. They start with time 0, 0, 0, and every time they have an event, they increment uh, their local time, and when they receive an event from another thread, they check uh, the uh, clock from the other thread, and they take the maximum uh, of uh, both the local and the remote clock and uh, this way you can track uh, the time uh, between uh, the relative time between events uh, that are happening over all threads. This can uh, this allows you to uh, do some visualization of your logs of your events. So on the left you have even um, vector clocks are representing are represented on uh, timelines. Uh, it's from a paper from '94, uh, detecting causal relationships in distributed computing uh, in search of the holy grail. And on the right, uh, you have a log analyzer uh, called uh, Shivis in uh, JavaScript. Um, here, uh, the, it's about uh, distributed computing, but this also applies for multi-threading and uh, microservices. Vector clock are very easy to implement. It's only uh, on the left 70 lines of code, on the right 70 lines of checks. And this can greatly help um, make sense of uh, your logs um, in a multi-threaded setting because classic timestamps 
uh, or even other display order cannot be relied upon. So third part, designing multi-threaded programs. We are uh, right now, uh, we are uh, in a discipline called software engineering, but there are many, many other uh, engineers out there. Civil engineering, mechanical, material engineering, industrial engineering, electrical, nuclear, chemical, aerospace, marine. You can, I'm pretty sure there are many others. And for all those disciplines, years of study, design, checks, audits go before building any uh, projects or products, be it an airplane or a building or submarines. And also, the higher the risks and the stakes, the longer the design phase. But in software engineering, often uh, we go right away to the prototype and sometimes the prototype, uh, the quick fix uh, becomes uh, the established uh, solution. Unfortunately for multi-threading, um, it might introduce uh, design roadblocks. And uh, like uh, the other disciplines, what they use to check uh, their design before uh, putting anything, uh, constructing anything, it's a blueprint. And this is something that uh, at least I, when I design with, uh, at one point uh, wanted so that I could check uh, on the blueprint, uh, the relationship uh, between um, my fr my worker friends, especially because uh, while uh, you are uh, deep in the code, you might miss some of the properties that are emerging at a high level uh, when uh, threads interact with each other. For example, let's say you have two threads. Uh, you have a door and you have a corridor you want to go through. Maybe your threads have the following behavior. Always open the door and let the other pass before you. So what happens if those uh, threads have this behavior? You have a contention to open the door because they rush to try to open the door before the other. And if you resolve that contention, then you have a deadlock because uh, no one wants to go through before the others. And last, maybe the, the door is already open, but that uh, can be tested for uh, in a single threaded program. But uh, the, the other two is something that you can only see um, when you have two threads. But the blueprints uh, are not enough for software engineering because code changes fast, much faster than uh, a building or an airplane under construction. And even innocuous things like comments or documentation go stale. Also, in many cases, the devil is in the implementation details. Um, if you re try reproducing papers in various disciplines, could be garbage collection, could be machine learning, it could be cryptography, it could be uh, graphics. Um, what you have uh, in those papers, sometimes an algorithm, is a blueprint, but um, you need to adapt it to the realities of your language, of your hardware, of memory management, and um, soon you get far from the blueprint uh, that was in the paper, but what you need is to check what you actually implemented. So rather than uh, a design that was um, on the paper, you need a blueprint of what you have implemented in particular to find corner cases One uh, useful uh, abstraction 
uh, for that is state machines. Because the hardest part of multithreading is handling state and visually in the state and the possible events that your uh, components react to is very, very useful to detect design bugs. Uh, when I call design bugs, it's something that is not in your code, but in your mind. Like, you expect your code to work this way, but it actually didn't. Uh, other abstractions uh, that uh, can be used uh, are uh, PetriNet and something also called uh, vector additions machines. The reason why is um, state machines and the others uh, can be uh, formally verified. So you can verify that you cover all your states and your events with automated tools, just like the compiler verifies that uh, your programs uh, is correct in terms of typing. And this is used in one uh, engineering discipline, uh, very um, near us, uh, hardware engineering, when you design uh, CPU or GPUs or routers or a cache currency protocol between uh, your CPU uh, caches. And they use state machines to validate the design in languages called the Verilog or VHDL. And this is needed because uh, creating a prototype costs thousands and uh, uh, uses uh, a lot of time. So, uh, after a time, uh, instead of um, uh, spending a lot of time uh, trying to debug uh, design uh, issues, uh, I wrote a state machine generator that is quite high performance. Uh, it uh, generates uh, uh, basically uh, if uh, and while loops, um, but uh, those uh, can be also displayed visually. And uh, you can see the order of a state uh, for a buyer, where when a, a worker reaches a buyer, it checks it if, if it has tasks, it, uh, it processes all of them, and then uh, try to steal tasks from other workers so that it helps uh, prog the overall progress of the runtime. It had a bug uh, that took me uh, quite a lot of time to find, so on the left, this was uh, the diagram of uh, the uh, state transitions. Uh, so the, in particular, the worker was only um, emptying the direct child tasks so that it could advance uh, if um, the tasks that I was not blocking on uh, were not uh, were still in the queue. Like, but uh, this led to an issue where uh, you, I had grandchildren tasks that were spawned by my uh, uh, direct children that were uh, kept in the queue. And then I had a deadlock because uh, all the other workers uh, were uh, sleeping and that thread was still um, waiting, trying to uh, uh, still more work. Other design bug, uh, design issues. The main issue with threads, if you are aware of undone laws, is that um, you you are uh, uh, limited by the serialization uh, of your code. If you only have 5% of your code that is serial instead of parallel, the maximum speedup you can get is about 20x. So you need to reduce your uh, ser uh, serial part as much as possible. This is um, explained uh, under the slogan uh, slow by the HPX uh, multithreading runtime. Slow for starvation, latencies, overhead and waiting for contention. And one of the main design issues that lead to slow is uh, mutable state. Uh, 
and sharing object and the share nothing. So what should you do instead of mutable objects? Well, if you can, prefer side effect free functions. You don't have to go uh, all the way down to Haskell, but if you can, do it. If you have to use mutable objects, at least don't share mutable fields across threads. Like if you have an array, um, use uh, access, uh, each thread have access to uh, different ranges of the array. Also, avoid uh, object-oriented programming because object-oriented programming is about having single instances, but single instances lead to contention when uh, they are accessed uh, from multiple threads. You can use object variants uh, actually as uh, almost classes and this is what I did uh, in my red tracer because uh, instead of uh, having a single instance of, the f of a sphere of, of the ground I just uh, copy and it's uh, sometimes quite often cheaper than contention and or synchronization. Obviously there are some cases like uh, maybe uh, you have a one gigabyte array of uh, floats and uh, you just cannot copy it or maybe on the GP where memory is even at more at a premium. The main takeaway is that isolate synchronization to few data structures that will be under high scrutiny like channels or maybe uh, your event bus or uh, your concurrent table. Example, well, this is not multi-threading per se, but this is uh, what can happen if uh, you don't manage uh, synchronization well, you have a mess. It's not all about don'ts. Uh, using function and messages, uh, enable new uh, use cases uh, related to uh, code correctness, so you can do black box testing or fuzzing. You compile your code and you submit messages or you call some functions and you check that the output is correct. You can even write automated test runner that have scenarios like send this message, message A, answer you will receive B, then send C, answer you receive D, send C again and uh, ensure that you receive uh, what you expect. And you can randomize the order um, uh, of uh, of this, and you can integrate that into a fuzzing framework. And part four, uh, correct by constructions programs. So as I said, correct by constructions are those that are by design um, free of design bugs. For multi-threading, it will be no deadlocks, no live log, no data races. No object lifetime bugs, like uh, it, the object is used uh, from another thread be before it was initialized by um, the main thread, for example. And most importantly, uh, your program uh, or your data structures does what it was specified to do. A concurrent queue returns uh, what you put uh, in order for example. Let's talk about uh, the story of a very hard to hunt bug. It took me, it took me five days or so of uh, running uh, and dealing with uh, uh, non-deterministic uh, behaviors. A quote from uh, Arthur Conan Doyle from Sherlock Holmes once you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. This was ultimately a deadlock bug in Jellipsy and Muscle. I was implementing a two-phase commit protocol, something that seemed very easy. I want to sleep. I'm sleeping. I wake up. Uh, well, another friend, uh, wake me up. But uh, what could happen is that there is a race between sleep and wake up. Between the sleep and actually sleeping, 
if you receive a wake up, well, what uh, then you sleep and you're deadlocked, which makes uh, the two phase commit protocol quite hard. Actually, there was even a published uh, two phase commit protocol that had uh, bugs uh, similar uh, in the past and that were uh, detected by using uh, formal verification. So, just to give you an idea of how simple it looks like. On the right, you have the data structures plus initialization and destructions, and sorry, on the left, and on the right, you have uh, the free um, uh, I want to sleep, prepare to park, sleeping, park, and uh, notify, which is wake up. It's less than 10 lines of code each. But uh, it was uh, quite hard to debug. So, proving my uh, code bug free. Formal verification is uh, you have uh, two techniques. One is uh, using proofs. So, this is uh, something uh, that, uh, that uh, Z3, uh, Dr. Nim, can help with. So proving, for example, uh, your uh, bound checks or proving that your uh, preconditions are actually always true uh, when uh, your function is called uh, in that phase. The other, ways, uh, other way to uh, formally verify your code is by testing every single input and checking that your output or your state uh, is correct. So. Uh, correctness could be uh, obviously uh, I wake up uh, when I, I have uh, uh, I receive a notification but also it could be uh, no deadlock or no live lock which is something uh, that was uh, I was struggling with with uh, threads that kept uh, waking uh, and sleeping but uh, not doing any useful work and for formal verification, I used something called TLA+, uh, Temporal Logic of Action. Here is an example of TLA+, uh, on the left. And on the right, uh, the model checker that, is, uh, that was stopped uh, after I introduced uh, a deadlock bug. And you can see that uh, even after uh, only with just uh, my couple of um, um, uh, pro uh, procedures, I have about uh, two millions of states uh, due to how the, the thread interleaving happens. And now you can see uh, the actual procedures, uh, prepare parking, park and notify on the left, and a s debug trace of uh, my code. So uh, this gives you the exact step, replay and state of the program. This helped me debug two things. So the live lock I talked about and also proving and give me confidence that my code was bug free and that if I still had deadlocks, which I did, it was somewhere else. So either Nim, but Nim was a very thin wrapper over glibc locks and condition variable, or maybe it was Linux. Well, in the end, uh, I found out that it was glibc that was buggy. I have a very in-depth issue uh, explaining that. My future goal, bring model checking to Nim. So I have a RFC, the first part, uh, is about um, formal verification uh, and uh, tools I would like to see in uh, Dr. Nim to help uh, debug uh, the state machine uh, I produce with uh, Synthesis so that uh, uh, it can be used for uh, multi-threading but maybe even uh, hardware design. And the second part is uh, about Thread Collider, a project uh, to uh, formally verify NIM concurrent programs and prove that uh, no uh, order of events in your hash table, for example, can lead to uh, 
reading an uninitialized memory. Uh, because uh, maybe uh, your hash table is in the process of uh, regrowing to have more um, space and another thread suddenly appears and reads that uh, memory. And that's it. Thank you very much.